So I'm going to be talking about lymph node management and advanced penile cancer. So we'll start with a case. Uh, we have a 77-year-old gentleman who was a car smoker, uncircumcised. Several months ago, he found a fibrotic papular lesion on his meatus. He had a shave biopsy, which showed squamous cell carcinoma. He was referred to urology, and on physical exam, he had a narrow meatus. He had multiple erosions and small plaques on his glands near the meatus, the frenulum, and the dorsal corona. His urethra was firm to palpation to the mid penile shaft. He was also noted to have a very small, mobile, uh, palpable lymph node on the left side, none on the right. He was counseled for and underwent a partial penectomy. Um, as you can see on the pathology, uh, we had to take uh, several specimens to get a final um, negative margin. Um, the pathology demonstrated invasive squamous cell carcinoma, poorly differentiated. Um, it was involving the corpus spongiosum. They said that it was going near the uh, corpus cavernosum, so they just gave it a PT2 instead of T3. Um, it had lymphovascular invasion and pearl neural invasion. Um, it came back positive for HPV16, and again, the uh, final margins were negative. So just briefly on penile cancer, it's a rare malignancy, uh, 04 to 0.6% of all malignancies. 30% of patients are diagnosed with advanced disease. The five-year survival is approximately 50%. Um, Non-invasive disease is 97%. It goes down to 55% in patients with PT3 disease. Um, just briefly on TNM staging, it's changed um, a little over the years. Um, TA is non-invasive. Um, T1 is invading the subepithelial connective tissue. Uh, T1A is without lymphovascular invasion, the most recent alpha added perineural invasion, and um, this is one of the only um, uh, T stagings that includes uh, differentiation, um, and it, uh, T1A is not poorly differentiated, grade one and two. Um, T1B is with lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion or poorly differentiated grade three or four. And um, T2 used to be corpus spongiosum and cavernosum, but now it got split into corpus spongiosum plus or minus urethral invasion, and T3 is corpus cavernosum plus or minus urethral invasion. Uh, T4 is invading adjacent structures. In terms of end staging, clinical staging is based on if the nodes are palpable or not. So N1 is if you have one unilateral inguinal lymph node, N2 is two or more unilateral lymph nodes or bilateral inguinal lymph nodes, N3 is a fixed inguinal uh, mass or pelvic uh, lymphadenopathy on imaging, and then pathologic staging N1 is two or fewer inguinal nodes on one side, and N2 is three or more unilateral nodes or bilateral METs, and then N3 is extranodal extension or positive pelvic imaging. End staging is yes or no, because we just said METs. So lymph node spread, uh, spreads, in, uh, lymph node disease spreads in a um, very systematic and um, orderly fashion in penile cancer. First goes to the superficial inguinal nodes, to the deep, and, and then to the pelvic, and then to the smooth passages. There's a 50 to 80 percent chance of crossover. Um, inguinal lymph node metastasis has been described as one of uh, the most prognostic indicator of survival in men with penile squamous cell carcinoma. Five-year uh, survival rates for PN0 disease has been reported to be 85 to 100 percent, and patients with positive disease statistically to 45 percent. So my first question was, um, who should get uh, inguinal lymph node dissection? Should my patient get it? Um, lymph node dissection in penile cancer has been shown to be both diagnostic and therapeutic and can be curative in about 30 to 60 percent of cases. Um, studies have shown that uh, lymph node dissection improves overall survival. However, it's a very morbid procedure um, with lots of complications. And so um, a study found that between 2004 and 2014, only 27 percent of patients who should have gotten uh, lymph node dissection actually received it. In patients with uh, non palpable inguinal lymph nodes, 25% um, of patients have micrometastatic disease. Several studies have uh, looked at uh, risk profiles of patients, and they found that patients with T1A or lower um, had a 0% chance of having uh, inguinal METs. Um, 
T1B or local vascular invasion had a 33% chance, and patients with T2 disease or higher or are poorly differentiated grade 3 or 4 had an 83% chance of having lymph node um, involvement. And so the NCCN guidelines uh, recommend that um, patients should have an inguinal lymph node dissection if they have T1B or higher. We also mentioned dynamic sentinel node biopsy, but it's very technically challenging. I don't think it's very um, done a lot in the uh, US, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, in regards to palpable disease, about 30 to 50 percent are can be due to inflammation. And traditionally, patients were treated with a six-week antibiotic course. However, it's been shown to delay definitive uh, therapy uh, of dissection, uh, which can potentially cure the disease. And um, given that uh, biopsy has a high sensitivity and positive predictive value, um, that's kind of the more, um, that's uh, been recommended more. Um, antibiotics is um, still used by some in the setting of infection and in patients with low-risk disease. So. The NCCN guidelines, if they have a unilateral lymph node less than four centimeters, that's not fixed, so mobile. If they're low risk, they should get a biopsy. If it's positive or if they have high risk uh, primary lesion, then they should have an inguinal lymph node dissection. Um, for patients with fixed or bulky nodes, um, there was a study by Pagliarov um, in 2010 that uh, was a prospective phase two trial. Uh, they looked at patients with clinically uh, uh, N2 or N3 disease, um, so bulky nodes, and um, they, the patients receive four cycles of neoadjuvant TIP, paclitaxel, ifosfamide, and cisplatin, followed by surgical resection. And they found that of the 30 patients who were treated, 15, uh, 15 patients or half had an objective response. Um, 22 patients had surgery, and um, three patients had no tumor on surgical specimen. Nine patients had no evidence of disease at medium follow-up of 34 months, and two patients died of other causes without any recurrent nodes. So the NCCN guidelines recommend um, for patients with palpable bulky lymph nodes to consider new adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, so I kind of mentioned about antibiotics and how that could delay care. So I wanted to know, um, does timing actually matter? Um, this was a study by Horenblatt from 2005 that looked at 40 patients with P22 to 3 disease and um, impalpable disease or impalpable nodes. 20 of them had positive nodes diagnosed on dynamic sentinel node biopsy and er underwent early excision. 20 patients had impalpable nodes and then developed palpable nodes later on, and so they had delayed excision. They found that the patients in the delayed group had more positive lymph nodes, 2.1 versus 1.6, and higher percent of extranodal expansion. And the three-year disease specific survival was much higher in patients who underwent early um, dissection, 84% versus uh, delayed, 35%. This was a, another study that looked um, to see if there was a oncologically safe window. Um, they found that the um, uh, window was like three months, and that a, even a delay of up to uh, three months could neg negatively impact disease survival. So the patients had PT2 disease, so high risk disease, and had a palpable node. So he was counseled for an um, inguinal lymph node dissection. Um, we uh, did it robotically. Um, the patient had a uh, staging CT scan, didn't show any um, distant metastasis or pelvic uh, lymph, lymph node involvement. Um, the patient was positioned in the lower lymphatic position. Uh, the robot was docked about 45 degrees lateral to the patient's side. Uh, we drew out the uh, borders of the dissection on the tie. Um, the superior line was drawn from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle, and then we chose the at midpoint, and then um, marked out 25 centimeters inferiorly for the camera port. And then uh, the um, one of the uh, robot arms was placed laterally, 20 centimeters inferiorly. And then um, the medial port was placed 15 centimeters uh, me, uh, inferiorly from the medial point. And then we placed the air seal between the lateral and the uh, camera port. So the borders were um, similar to a um, uh, standard template um, uh, angle of dissection. Um, so to create the working space, uh, we made a two centimeter incision at the 25 centimeter midpoint below the inguinal ligament, and we used our digit and um, 
as well as the trocar and the camera to kind of help dissect and create the working space. This was um, underneath Scarpa's fascia. And uh, once we created a uh, big enough working space, we placed the uh, additional trocars on rear vision. And then basically we um, dissected up towards the inguinal ligament so that we could create the working space. Um, and uh, the boundaries of the uh, lymph node dissection uh, was the inguinal ligament superiorly, sartorius muscle laterally, and the adductor longus muscle medially um, to the um, uh, apex of the femoral triangle. And then we identified the saphenous vein, which was spared. We clipped small branches of the femoral vessels. And then uh, for the superficial dissection, we um, took all the fibro fatty tissue above the fascia lata. Um, we controlled the lymphatics with bipolar in the literature. Um, the patient had, they used a lot of clips, which we could have used as well. Um, the uh, packet was removed in the endocatch bag and removed. Unfortunately, the frozen section Judy, quick question. positively bilaterally. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Can you go back a couple slides? So that, oh, nope, one more. That, the finger there, What what is that? Is it? Is the plane you're working with superficial to scarpas or deep? So we to scarpas? were deep to scarpas. All right. Why do you think they show it superficial there? Is that the right working space? Um, typically, the reason I ask is because typically, you know, like at least the most common surgical teaching, what I do, and I think what Dr. Kohlberg does, is work deep to scarpas. Yeah. Um, because if you work superficial to scarpas, you um, you can kill your skin flap. And, you know, the wound complication rate from this operation, at least done open, is incredibly high. It's like two-thirds or something. Yeah. And so one of the key things is to remain deep to scarpas to try to keep uh, your skin flap alive. So most of the papers that I did see said that they were deep to scarpas when they dissected the plane. Um, I think that this was one of the older papers that I had looked at um, that described it. I liked the picture on the right, which is why I included it, but I just yeah. read that. It, it seems like there should be like a red X through that one. Okay. So, which is why I said we were deep to scarpas, but we That's, were deep to scarpas. Yeah, I'm just, I was just clarifying. Thank you. Um, Rosens came back positive bilaterally. Uh, so we uh, performed a deep inguinal lymph node dissection by incising the fascia lata to the inguinal ligament, and then we moved the fiber fatty tissue underneath. Uh, so we placed grains on each side. Uh, Postoperatively, patient did well. He was discharged home post-op day one. However, at follow-up in two weeks, patient has had persistent lymphatic wound of about 300 cc per drain. Um, so, uh, open versus robotic and lymph node dis dissection. Um, so, I kind of already went over the boundaries, um, but basically for the open technique, you um, make a big incision, like a, either like a hockey stick or like an S incision. And um, it's a very morbid procedure, uh, has complication rates um, reported in the literature I saw up to like 80%. Um, it uh, can lead to marked lymphedema, flap necrosis, and symptomatic lymphocytes. Um, because of the morbidity associated with um, the standard um, uh, technique, um, modified approaches, have been described. It was first described in 1988 by Catalona, and he reduced the dissection lateral to the femoral vessels and caudal to the fossil valis while preserving the saphenous veins. Um, they've uh, added additional techniques to it, including a shorter incision, avoiding the sartorius muscle transposition, and utilizing thicker skin flap, as Dr. Uh, Penny mentioned. Uh, Dr. Kohlberg had a paper in 1997 that followed this group of nine patients. Uh, who had clinically impalpable disease, who underwent the modified technique. Three had positive lymph nodes. None of the patients had recurrence. There were no deaths. And two patients had skin flap necrosis. Um, in the literature, um, uh, the modified technique has about a 27% morbidity rate that's been reported. Um, more recently, um, minimal invasive techniques have been described. Uh, the first laparoscopic um, or video endoscopic, um, which, is, which is what they call it, inguinal um, lymphadenectomy was performed in 2003 by Bischoff. In 2009, the first uh, robotic dissection for penile cancer uh, was described by uh, Josephson. 
this was a study uh, from MD Anderson uh, that looked at 10 patients with uh, T1, T3, N0 penile cancer. Uh, this was a prospective phase one study that enrolled patients from 2010 to 2012. Uh, so basically the patients underwent robot, the uh, robotic uh, inguinal lymph node dissection, and then they had a separate surgeon come in to verify if the dissection was adequate by um, creating a separate um, incision that was uh, small, three to four centimeters, kind of along the inguinal region, and then um, making sure that there were no extra nodes that were left behind. Um, so out of the 10 patients, two had um, positive nodes, and all of the no positive nodes were detected um, by, during the robotic portion. Eight of the patients had um, negative nodes, and the mean um, uh, lymph node yield on both sides was nine um, each. And um, one of the only one of the patients had to be converted to open dissection. Um, I think they had gone in into the muscle and they were in the wrong plane, so they didn't know where they were. Um, in the uh, 19 fields that were done robotically, they thought that in 18 of them they had um, adequate dissection. Um, in the one inguinal field, they found two benign nodes, um, dyskinesis corpus fascia, above the inguinal dissection field. Um, and so they concluded that um, the robotic approach can allow for adequate dissection and staging of um, inguinal disease. They recently also um, uh, presented an abstract of um, last year's AUA um, in 2018. So they compared their robotic cohort to um, a similar open cohort, and um, they looked at complication rates and recurrence rate and um, deaths. And um, they found that the only uh, difference between the two groups that they reported was operative time. So the robotic approach was much longer, 373 minutes versus uh, 262 minutes. Um, this was a recent study uh, that also looked at robotic versus open inguinal lymph node dissection in penile cancer patients. So this was performed at a tertiary center in India. Um, so 51 patients underwent robotic uh, dissection and 100 underwent open. And this is back in 2012 and 2015. The decision to uh, do robotic versus open was left to the patient, um, and the determining factor was mostly cost. Um, the robotic patients were older, and uh, but otherwise the demographics were the same. They saw a similar lymph node yield, 13 in the robotic cases versus 12 in the open, and um, they had no recurrences uh, with a medium follow-up of 40 months. Um, they found that there was no difference in blood loss. However, again, um, they found that operative time was higher in the robotic um, approach versus open, 75 versus 60. They also didn't include uh, robot docking time, so if you include that, it would be much higher. Um, uh, they found that patients who underwent the robotic approach had uh, lower, um, uh, shorter uh, hospital stay, three days versus four days, and that the number of days with the drain kept in place was lower, 12 versus 15 days. They looked at complications, and they found that um, uh, the number of any complication was high in both groups, 78 versus 85 but the major complications were much lower in patients who underwent the robotic uh, approach, 2% versus 17%. In particular, um, there was uh, decreased edge necrosis and flat necrosis and severe limb edema. So I kind of uh, talked a little bit about lymph node yield and the robotic versus open approach. Um, does that matter in penile cancer? Um, uh, there were several studies that um, found that um, a lymph node yield of 16 bilaterally um, was kind of like a key number and can affect uh, and improve five-year overall survival rate. In this study, um, when they stratified by lymph node positive or negative disease, it was only significant in patients with lymph node positive. There was a, but there was another study that uh, found that it was significant in um, uh, nodal negative disease as well. Um, in terms of lymph node density, uh, they found that um, uh, patients with a lymph node density of less than 12.5% had a higher five-year overall survival uh, compared to those who had higher. So positive nodes are the total nodes in which. So um, my next question was for patients. He had um, four positive nodes and he had bilateral lymph node disease. Um, should he get a pelvic lymph node dissection? 
So this was a retrospective review of 79 patients treated with prophylactic pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, patients were included if they were chemotherapy naive. They had two or more positive nodes, um, extra nodal extension, um, or, and no evidence of pelvic disease on imaging. Um, they found that uh, 24 patients, 24% uh, of these patients had positive uh, pelvic nodes. Um, they found that patients with external nodal extension and two or more positive nodes had a four to five um, time, uh, odds ratio of four to five times to have positive pelvic node. Um, they did find that in patients who had positive pelvic lymph nodes, the um, survival was, uh, five year survival, disease specific survival was uh, less than 10% versus 63% patients who had negative pelvic lymph nodes. Um, uh, what about bilateral pelvic lymph node um, dissection? Who should get bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection? This uh, study found that the only predictor of bilateral pelvic lymph node metastasis was four or more positive nodes. They also found that in patients with bilateral inguinal lymph node mets, uh, there was increased um, uh, regional lymph node uh, recurrence in patients who were treated with unilateral pelvic lymph node dissection compared to bilateral. So 47% at 5.5 months versus 20% at 12.8 months. And they also saw a tend to improve overall survival in um, patients who were treated bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection compared to unilateral. Um, this is the NCCN guidelines. So basically they recommend pelvic lymph node dissection for patients with PN2 or 3 disease. Um, so just this also mentions like chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So just briefly on multimodal therapy. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps skipping. But um, so uh, I already discussed the study that looked at new edge MTIP um, for uh, fixed and bulky lymph nodes. Um, there was another study by DeLorenzo that looked at cisplatin and 5-FU for stage 4 disease. They found a 32% partial response, um, but um, a high number of patients developed uh, severe neutropenia, 20%. Um, there was a study uh, by Sharma that looked at um, adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with positive pelvic lymph nodes and found a improved overall survival. This is, this is just a chart of... Um, uh, various other uh, regimens that have been studied. And then um, recently there was a study uh, that was published in Urologic Oncology um, that found that um, chemotherapy was an, uh, ineffective in patients with N1 and 2 disease, but had overall uh, improved survival, overall survival in patients with um, N3 disease. It was statistically significant, um, in, again, in patients with um, pelvic uh, lymph node meds. In regards to radiation therapy, there's not a lot of uh, good data showing that uh, the benefit of radiation therapy in uh, penile cancer. Um, so uh, the UA doesn't recommend it except as a palliative option, um, but they said they, it can be considered in selected patients with extra nodal extension. This was a study that looked at adjuvant pelvic radiation in um, patients with positive pelvic lymph nodes. And basically they found that um, patients who did not get pelvic radiation had worse overall survival, worse disease specific survival and higher overall recurrence. Um, this was um, a study uh, basically that looked at the uh, National Cancer Database in patients with um, positive uh, lymph nodes. And um, they looked at, they stratified them by like the treatments that they receive. So um, again, uh, lymph node dissection improves survive, overall survival. Um, um, but when they stratified by uh, each type of thing that they got, so lymph node dissection with, um, with uh, radiation or chemotherapy, uh, they found that chemotherapy and radiation um, did not affect overall survival. So are there any ongoing studies currently? So this is the International Penile Advanced Cancer Trial. It's a multinational uh, collaboration uh, that has a goal of recruiting 400 patients with clinically palpable lymph nodes over a five-year period. They're randomizing patients into upfront inguinal lymph node dissection, new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery, new adjuvant chemoradiation followed by um, surgery. And then if they have... Uh, positive nodes, they're going to be stratified as low or high risk, and high risk patients are going to get, um, be stratified or randomized into prophylactic or no prophylactic pelvic lymph node dissection. So hopefully this will give us more um, information on um, the timing of uh, and the utilization of uh, multimodal therapy. Uh, so um, 
just as a wrap up, if uh, patients have um, impalpable uh, inguinal nodes, if they have intermediate or high risk disease, so T1B or higher, they should get a inguinal lymph node dissection. If um, they have positive uh, palpable nodes, if they're um, non bulky they, and high risk, they should get a uh, inguinal lymph node dissection. If it's low risk, they should get a biopsy. If they have bulky nodes, you should consider um, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, again, early dissection is better. Um, you, we should try to perform them within three months. Um, uh, robotic surgery um, seems to have equivalent lymph node yields as um, open surgery. Um, uh, it's been, uh, it has longer operative times, but um, can potentially decrease the hospital length of stay and um, decrease complications. However, there should be more studies on long-term oncologic outcomes. Um, pelvic lymph node dissection should be performed in patients with N2, T3 disease, and um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy should be given for cis or bulky disease, um, and then you can consider adjuvant chemo or radiation for N3 disease. And then back to my patient, the plan is for him to get a pelvic lymph node dissection in the near future. Almost 2020, uh, physical exam is still the gold standard for clinical staging. So if you, let's say a patient comes in, they're 400 pounds, and um, they have, uh, you know, a, let's say like a T2 um, penile cancer, and you can't feel anything on the exam, but, but they have two centimeter nodes in both groins. So if they're, if you can't, Palpate it, then you should get imaging chemo. You should get imaging chemo. Right, but the clinical staging you're emphasizing is based on whether or not the nodes are palpable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I think I think just the the staging. We, uh, I wouldn't be so particular about the idea that it has to be that it has to be palpable. So if someone has, um, like uh, someone's had has some reason you can't feel or feel their nodes well or examine them well, they're obese, which is really common. Um, they've had prior surgery there, something like that. Um, uh, I would not, wouldn't ignore um, nodes on imaging or I, I, I think of it as being palpable or visible on imaging. Uh, CT, typically. And the radiologists often don't call them. So it's it's very common for them to. What's that? Yes, in this disease only. I just want to talk about surgical options for BPH with a yellow urology focus, uh, especially help with best counter and the surgery for BPH that we're doing on campus. Uh, no disclosures. Just as a brief introduction, definition, BPH is increase of prostatic, stromal, and epithelial cells, resulting in formation of a large, discrete nodule in the surface of the yellow prostate. Uh, in contrast, benign prostatic hypertrophy refers to growth in the size of individual cells. Um, here you can see uh, BPH and LUTs, some ir irritative symptoms and obstructive symptoms as well. Uh, subjective outcomes for LUTs to BPH are measured by IPSS and should be obtained in initial consultation or routinely thereafter. The score is 0 to 7 is considered mildly symptomatic, 8 to 19, moderately symptomatic and 20 to 35, severely symptomatic. Uh, for AUA guidelines, indications for non-medical treatments for LUTs and BPH include acute urinary retention, uh, recurrent bladder calcula, azotemia, recurrent urinary tract infection, recurrent hematuria, forcing LUTs, uh, refractory to medical therapy, or unwillingness to use or um, intolerance to other therapies. 
Uh, there are several options for treating um, LUTs and DTH and bladder obstruction. We can start with watchful waiting. Um, if medical therapy is necessary, uh, the options include phytotherapy, alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and combination therapy. Uh, Office-based treatments include uh, transurethral microwave thermotherapy, transurethral um, mean ablation, water-reducing uh, thermotherapy, as well as Urolift, which I'm going to focus on as well. Uh, most surgical center or hospital-based treatments include transurethral resection of the prostate, which is the gold standard, transurethral incision of the prostate, open surgery, uh, vaporization, <coughs> interstitial laser coagulation, uh, visual laser ablation of the prostate, uh, prosthetic stents, uh, and whole lab, which I'll be concentrating on today as well. Um, so the goal is to achieve uh, efficacy of TERP in terms of minimally invasive procedures for DTH uh, with a more safe, uh, favorable safety profile. Ideally, it'd be cost-effective, easy to perform, uh, rapid and durable uh, relief of symptoms, ambulatory setting, local anesthetic, short recovery time, uh, smooth return to normal activity, and preservation of sexual function. Um, to start, uh, we have here TUNA. Uh, under direct visualization through a cystoscope-like device, two needles at fixed radially angle lateral to the device are inserted into the prostate parenchyma. Uh, each needle emits radio frequency energy, heating the prostate with the goal of full completion necrosis. <laughs> Depending on the prostate size, length, multiple rounds can be completed. Uh, proposed advantage is heating of the prostatic tissue with urethral mucosal preservation, aiding in patient tolerance. Several studies have compared tuna with TERP. Um, demonstrate improvement in symptoms in the tuna group. However, uh, improvements were greater in the TERP group um, and retreatment rates were prohibitively higher in tuna groups. <clears throat> Compared to the TERP, however, side effects are infrequent, mild, and self-limiting. According to AOA guidelines, tuna is no longer recommended. Uh, there is QMT, um, under microwave antenna mounted on a urethral catheter. QMT really heats the prostate, leading to tissue necrosis without unintended thermal spread to the sphincter, rectum, and bladder neck. A uh, wide variety of QMT systems were available, however, due to decreasing use in preceding years. Only a few are more uh, commercially available. Uh, TUMT enthusiasm has waned as there are some concerns about efficacy and durability. Uh, the advent of higher energy systems seem to improve durability without increasing complications, but a lack of efficacy has moved this technology towards uh, not using it. Serious complications are infrequent. Uh, there's a resume, uh, convective water vapor therapy or resume system that de de uh, delivers targeted and controlled doses of thermal energy directly into the prostate, causing transitional cell, cell death. Under direct vision, a narrow sheet similar in size and shape to a cystoscope is inserted via the urethra. The needle is displayed, deployed near the tip of the scope through the urethral um, urethelium into the prostate parenchyma. Water is heated externally and injected via the needle as steam to supply um, convective heat to the hyperplastic prostatic tissue. Uh, when the water vapor comes into contact with prostatic tissue, it releases stored thermal energy, leading to cell death and tissue volume contraction. Uh, so in 2015, uh, McBarry et al. conducted a multi-center randomized controlled trial, including 197 men randomized in a two-to-one fashion to resume versus sham procedure. IPSS in the resume and control group was reduced by 11.2 uh, and 4.3, respectively. Four-year follow-up was published in 2019. Lower urinary tract symptoms were significantly improved in less than, uh, than equal to three months after thermal therapy and remained uh, consistent and durable. And the uh, surgical retreatment rate was 4.4% over four years. And there were no disturbances in sexual function uh, that we reported. <laughs> Aquabean system, aquabean ablation, in 2017, this is robotically controlled high pressure water jet, real time uh, transrectal ultrasound guidance, uh, uses principle of hydrosection to ablate prosthetic tissue, uh, no use of thermal energy, and hemostasis is achieved with the interaction of the water resistance. Uh, and this is a water trial in the double blind multi center perspective randomized controlled trial, uh, 181 patients with moderate to severe LUTs related to BPH um, underwent um, TERP or aqua ablation. Primary efficacy endpoint was reduction in IPSS to six months. Mean total operative time was similar for aquablation and TERP, but resection time was lower for aquablation. At six months, uh, patients treated with aquablation and TERP experienced large IPSS improvements. Uh, the uh, the pre-specified study non-inferiority hypothesis was satisfied. Uh, among sexually active men, the rate of anejaculation was lower than those who treated with 
aquaplation um, and uh, versus turf, larger prostates, 50 to 80 cc's, demonstrate a more pronounced superior safety and efficacy benefit. Um, to continue, there are also injections. Several injectables have been studied in the treatment of LUTs, including botulinum toxin NX1207 and PRX302, uh, salicin. These substances can be injected into the prostate, um, parenchyma via a transurethral, transrectal, or perineal approach. In theory, the agent leads to focal changes in the prostate, reducing volume and alleviating obstructive symptoms. Um, demonstrated in, um, improvement in IPSS versus control at 12 month follow up, uh, minimal adverse effects. Another agent, NX1207, uh, fexapotide triflutate P, causes apoptotic cell death. It's been shown in phase one and phase two trials to cause significant clinical improvement without. Uh, with minimal adverse effects. Uh, phase three study was performed, 995 patients, UPH at 72 uh, sites, treated three to two FT to placebo, long-term IPSS change uh, from baseline was higher in FT treated patients compared to placebo. Uh, Long-term uh, incidence of intervention for BPH was reduced in the FT group versus oral uh, BPH medications. Uh, there are no difference in placebo in number of type of uh, adverse events. Uh, finally, here, uh, prosthetic Urolift involves implantation of tissue retracting implants inserted under cystoscopic guidance using the Urolift delivery system. Here's an example of the delivery system and the permanent implant. Uh, appropriate selection, patient selection based on prostate anatomy is critical for the success of this operation. Um, typically, four to six implants are placed in an anterior lateral position that avoids the dorsal venous complex and neurovascular complex. I'm gonna show you a video. Here's a video demonstrating how it works. Um, the implant is introduced cystoscopically. A fine 19 gauge needle is used to deploy So the first multi-center prospective randomized controlled trial uh, known as the LIFT study randomly assigned 206 patients in a two to one fashion to either Eurolift or SHAM. Statistically significant improvements in AUA um, IPSS as well as QMAX were noted at 12 month follow-up and there was sustained improvement of IPSS at four and five years follow-up. Uh, retreatment rates for Eurolift are similar to TERP. Um, which is around two to three percent versus one to two percent, respectively. Uh, five years, thirteen point six percent underwent retreatment, uh, four point three percent with an additional Eurolift, and nine point three percent with a TERP or a DDP. Adverse effects were few and self-limited, um, including dysuria and hematuria, and were mild to moderate. Um, 100% of the adverse uh, effects were educated by independent committee that reviewed the data. Uh, to emphasize here also, sexual function was stable over five years uh, with no de novo sustained erectile or ejaculatory growth in this study. So in summary, um, increasing options for patients with moderate to severe loss from BPH is important. Office-based therapy or outpatient settings the goal for what we just discussed. Uh, results are approaching the gold standard uh, TERP. Uh, there's decreased risk of sexual side effects. Uh, clinical outcomes are promising. Long-term follow-up is needed to, to, to determine durability. Um, so moving on to more uh, invasive procedures. The TERP, TERP is the gold standard. Um, less invasive than open prostatectomy, um, but requires regional uh, or general anesthetic in an inpatient setting. Its complications um, include infection, bleeding, and a 20% risk of reoperation within 10 years. Uh, retrograde ejaculation after surgery is usual, whereas impotence or incontinence is rare. 
of the approximately 300,000 surgical procedures performed each year for BPH, most are TERP. Um, almost 90% of individuals treated will have experienced an improvement in the symptoms of BPH. Uh, it's important to be conscious of time resecting during monopolar TERP. Uh, increased operative time increases the risk of absorption of hypertonic solution, which uh, results in dilutional hyperkalemia. Uh, most authorities recommend limiting the operative time to 60 to 90 minutes for very large glands due to increased operative duration and risk of complications. Monopolar TERP can be performed as a staged procedure. Um, and just briefly, the clinical picture of TR syndrome can vary widely from mild neurological symptoms to coma. Um, cardiorespiratory symptoms may be present as well as a result of fluid overload if a large volume of fluid was absorbed through the resected bed of the prostate. Treatment for TR syndrome is mainly supportive. Slow correction of uh, hyponatremia can be corrected uh, at no greater than one millimole per, uh, per liter per hour to avoid uh, central pontine myelinosis. Um, I didn't talk about this, but a, a number of randomized controlled trials have been performed to compare bipolar TERP versus monopolar TERP. Um, but it's been suggested that bipolar TERP is an efficacious way to perform a section of the prostate. Uh, and here we're talking about HOLEP, the Holmium Yttrium Aluminum Garnet Holyag laser was originally used in treating stones, but has since been adopted to BPH therapy. Laser energy is absorbed by aqueous irrigant in close proximity to the laser fiber tip resulting in a vaporization bubble leading to micro explosions. This results in tissue destruction, although its ability to vaporize um, is inefficient as minimal energy penetrates the tissue surface. Holmium laser has also been used extensively in nucleation of the prostate, which you talked about here as HOLEP. Multiple patient series have described how large glands have been successfully treated by HOLEP. Um, critics do note that a difficult learning curve as well as a need for morselation to nucleate large lobes um, is kind of the, um, the learning could be the barrier to adopting the technology. Here's just a picture of an, uh, an example of how it works. Here you have the orange thing with the laser going off the orange, the orange skin. Here's an actual, just a picture of after you get the um, adrenal into the bladder, you have to use a morselator to take it out. Okay. So TERP is the gold, historical gold standard to which all surgical modalities for BPH are compared. Uh, HOLEP is poised to replace TERP as a standard based on years of data uh, that consistently demonstrates equivalent or superior outcomes for fewer post-operative complications, and longer durability based on reoperation uh, re rates. Table, table below is a sample of outcome data from several randomized controlled trials comparing HOLEP and TERP. You can see that there's statistic, statistically significant difference in length of stay as well as catheter time. Uh, an argument against HOLEP is that operative times are significantly longer than the TERP. However, studies have also found that the, oops, I those arrows, that the, the mean tissue resection rate for HOLEP and TERP was, were about the same, uh, just because of you know, longer time, but they're taking care of more prosthetic tissue. Um, so it would make them kind of equally time efficient procedures. And you can also see that avoiding parameters and symptom improvements were similar between HOLEP and TERP. Um, here's table two from the same paper. So since the origin of HOLEP in the early 1990s, it has revolutionized the surgical management of men with large prostates, uh, men with adenomas being too large to resect endoscopically, bless you, are often advised to undergo open prostatectomy. Um, a surgery associated with high transfusion rates, lengthy catheterization times, and hospital stays, averaging as many as 5.4 to 10 days. Uh, contrary to TERP, HOLEP is a size independent procedure. HOLEP has been used to successfully nucleate adenomas as large as 800 cc's. Uh, numerous well designed studies have demonstrated the HOLEP outcomes, catheterization time, and hospital stay. Uh, hospital length of stay are independent of preoperative TERP's volume. So HOLEP and, and open prospecting outcomes have been directly compared. Here are two examples in multiple well-designed RCTs. Uh, Kuntz demonstrated that HOLEP could be used to resect adenomas greater than 100 grams with similar efficacy as open prostatectomy, uh, but with radically decreased hospitalization stay, catheterization times, blood loss, and transfusion rates. And also NASPRO demonstrated a um, similar randomized prospective study comparing whole up to open prostatectomy in 80 patients with prostates larger than 70, two years of follow-up, 
it down almost equivocal function outcomes, but a lower transfusion rate, decreased catheterization time, and shorter hospital stay. Patients who underwent whole up versus over press technique, effective treatment. Uh, furthermore, efficiency and efficacy of the operation were not compromised. Procedure duration and a um, AOCD scores for these reports were equivalent. Uh, one of the things, the press the greatest obstacle to widespread implementation of whole lip academic and private centers worldwide remains that the procedure's steep learning curve. There's multiple publications describing self-taught learning experiences uh, with time to expertise um, reportedly requiring as many as 50 cases. Um, Al Hakim and uh, Ahilali reported that the two most difficult technical steps were the initial apical nucleation and incision of the antero uh, apical mucosal attachment of the lateral lobes. I'll show you the video in a little bit. Uh, they reported that surgical proficiency with HOLEP was achieved after a mean of 20 patients. HOLEP at Yale. So here's a video of um, one of the patients here, 65 year old male, BPH, and bladder stones, AUA symptom score 28, pressure volume 77 cc's. Here we can see the scope being advanced from the very montanum into the bladder. We see some bladder stones. Um, you can treat the bladder stones with the same laser that you're going to be doing whole up with. Here we start uh, the very montana is just to your screen left and your left lateral lobes to your screen right. And we're starting um, just lateral to the, to the very montana. The very montana is right behind us right there. And uh, get down to the capsule. Now he's done it bilaterally. Now we're kind of resecting the meaning lobe off to the level of the bladder neck. see that the tissue has fallen to the bladder. Next you'll see um, the apical kind of dissection. So we'll go up. Now we're looking actually at the apical uh, or, at, or at the anterior dissection now. And this is the right lateral lobe. We're trying to dissect it this way to the right lateral side. And here is uh, the left lateral lobe. I'm just kind of finishing up um, the procedure. Here we see um, the hemostasis, wide open, wide open head. And then to take the tissue out, we use a morselator. It's about 10 grams per minute. Say thank you, Dr. Kellner. Uh, as you've been seeing a lot of um, pull ups uh, at SRC at the HP, right now it's a procedure. We were able to get them out to post up day zero, post up day one, uh, a little more complicated, and it's anecdotal. The largest prostate I've removed so far is 240 cc's. Um, I just don't want to get into a situation where uh, it is a steep learning curve. I've done, I think, 34 cases to date. Um, most of the patients I've had have had very large prostates, 100 cc's plus. Uh, it's impressive how much tissue we get. I mean, we're, we're getting, you know, sometimes 150 grams of tissue. And it's interesting when you get the path report, the pathologist will read uh, you know, 4,332 pieces of uh, tissue you know, and sometimes even find prostate cancer. So I don't even know how the pathologist goes through this because it looks like, you know, chewed up uh, tiny particles that we send them um, in like, like margin containers. Um, ultimately, we can do prostates 300, 500 cc's. Um, the big issue comes uh, with the morselation time. We have prostates that large and some institutions are doing hybrid procedures where they'll, they'll basically do the whole left to liberate the prostate and then they'll make a small cystotomy to pull out the tissue or Park the robot. I think, uh, Pat, you told me that up in Leahy Clinic, they're doing a hybrid where they'll open the robot and kind of just take out the tissue that way. I mean, some way that defeats the whole beauty of having a minimally invasive procedure if you have to make an incision. Um, so I'm not there yet, um, uh, but ultimately I think we'll be there. We haven't really marketed this. I imagine once we start telling people we do the procedure, we'll start getting like kind of the worst of the worst cases down here. So.
assume that uh, sometimes there's perforation, and if so, uh, do you proceed along or do you stop at that point? So um, it's amazing. So when I was watching uh, some of the uh, experts in the, the uh, who are visiting around the country, uh, it was amazing how much times I was seeing fat or they were actually going through the capsule and they said, it's amazing, there's, there's no issues. Um, it's, it's just not really a problem. Sometimes you'll get into like a sinus where there's more bleeding. You can put a monopolar loop in and uh, help control the bleeding, but um, it really is not an issue. Uh, it's when you're doing these procedures, you're, everything's very distended. You're using kind of high pressure fluid. And once the, uh, the fluid is decompressed, um, those areas that seem like they're kind of spread open, uh, kind of contract down and, and it, it really is not an issue. Uh, so far, we've taken out everyone's Foley catheter the day after the surgery. So one of the, I mean, I think one of the th nice things about TERP is that patients aren't incontinent afterwards. And with HOLEP, um, the, the literature suggests that a significant percentage of the patients have transient incontinence. I was wondering if you could just kind of describe what a typical experience is. So in the literature, they discuss about um, up to 40% risk of uh, incontinence, which is considered transient. Uh, for the most part, uh, patients are continent between six to 12 weeks. Uh, by one year, 99% of patients are continent. Um, it is nerve wracking. So I had some patients who were very symptomatic and had a lot of incontinence. And I was kind of um, shaking uh, in my boots, thinking I did something bad to the, these people. But it's actually, I've seen with time, everyone's gotten better so far. Um, so I am getting confidence that it's, it is a transient thing. Um, I think that uh, there's probably some benefit in teaching people Kegel exercises or some pelvic rehabilitation early if they're having trouble. Also, you could consider um, use the use of anticholinergics early as well. Because a lot of it is, is urgency they're having. And other people, it, it is uh, a stress incontinence. So I do see a combination of both. I think the patients who are the most incontinent are the ones who um, our older patients, and this is what's seen in the literature, and I think I'm observing it as well, and people with really large prostate, so over 100 cc's, we're seeing a little more. Um, I think in my own patient population, I've only had 34 patients I've done so far, and I'd say the uh, incontinence rate is probably about 20%. Um, that's just kind of an estimate, uh, but I don't see it as a long-term problem. Dan? Over here. Uh, 70, 80 gram bilober hyperplastic prostate. Uh, how would you choose between Urolif and HOLEP procedure? So um, I think when you look at the uh, prostate, um, I think, I think a, a cystoscopic view of the prostate is very, very important. Um, so someone with an 80 gram prostate, you can do a Urolift on. Um, what you need to talk to the patients about is what's their real desire. If they want to have one surgery, never need another surgery, and they're not sexually active, I think a HOLEP makes a lot of sense. Uh, but the chance of having uh, retrograde ejaculation is very high with the whole lip. It's 75%. Um, if, they're, if they're really, in, uh, if it's very important to them that they maintain their ability to ejaculate, I think it's worthwhile to do a Urolift. Uh, but the chance of them needing another operation in the future is higher. Um, so I, I think you could tailor the operation to the patient. Uh, the nice thing about the Urolift, and Richard really didn't talk about, it, is we do it right in the office uh, just with local anesthetic. And we don't have to go to the operating room. So if someone's a high-risk surgical patient, I think a Urolift I, I would try to do. Uh, but if they're a good surgical candidate um, and they just want to have one operation and the risk of needing another surgery in the future is almost 0%, I think a whole lot makes sense. meeting, right? Yep.